Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Angela Boldini, as you can see. Um, I'm a, a cognitive scientist. I've done research on uh, the cognitive science field in, in the field of learning and memory in particular. And I'm one of the three speakers of this webinar. I leave it to Alessandro to introduce himself. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Alessandro Zocchi and I am a psychobiologist and psychopharmacologist. I've been working as a research scientist on the biological basis of behavior, but more lately I've been teaching at the university, educational neurosciences, and I collaborate with some educational organizations and teaching stuff about educational neuroscience. And then we have also Eleonora Vagnoni. Hi all, I am Eleonora Vagnoni and I teach cognitive psychology at Bournemouth University in the UK. I have more than 10 years of experience as a researcher and a lecturer in the field of cognitive psychology and I have worked between the UK and Italy. My field of research is how the brain represents the space around the body. And I investigate this topic using uh, both behavioral and neurophysiological measures. Okay, thank you. So I'm the one who starts this um, webinar. And, okay, I'm sharing now my presentation. I hope you can see it, yes. Okay, so basics of educational neurosciences when using educational technologies. Um, well, if you are here, I guess you all know what we mean with uh, educational neurosciences, and I also guess that you all know what we mean with educational technologies. So basically, this webinar, we will focus on the relationship between uh, educational technologies, uh, educational tools, and cognition, okay? Um, as a cognitive scientist and uh, being um, especially focused on learning, memory, so all the processes involved into, into learning, basically, um, I'm very interested, obviously, in this topic. This was not the topic of my research, but is absolutely a relevant topic nowadays because, as you all know, technology is a very important part in our lives in general, but in, in, uh, in the world of education as well. And I would say most of all, but mm, okay, I leave that to you. Um, certainly, Technologies had um, a, an extremely important uh, role. For example, in our recent events, we all live this uh, pandemic, and we all know the importance that uh, technology had. You know, in 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 those moments, in those moments where we all, we were all um, uh, at home, and it's only thanks to technology that we had the possibility to keep learning, to keep uh, as teacher, to keep uh, uh, delivering our lectures, delivering um, information, delivering education in general. So the, the importance, uh, the importance of, of educational technology is absolutely uh, evident to everyone. And uh, its advantages as well, not only, thank goodness, not only in, um, in dramatic moments as the ones we lived very recently, but in general, in general, um, especially in, in some specific context and with some specific, um, for example, difficulties, uh, um, in, with some specific learning difficulties, uh, educational technologies are absolutely uh, relevant, important, and helpful in overcoming those difficulties. 
and these are only a few examples. What um, cognitive scientists uh, have started to research and investigate lately are um, the effect that these continues and these more and more important role of technology in general, in the world of education, but in general in our lives has um, res uh, um, for our cognition. So what's the effect that, for example, relying on the ed tech number one that we have, which is the internet, which is the, the source of information that we have in our pocket and that uh, um, it's uh, illimit um, it, that has no no limits right uh, what's the effect of having and uh, uh, accessing that type of source of information all the time and every time we need to know something what are the effects that this new habit that we developed in the last 20, 25 years, more or less, has on our cognition, if there are any effects, right? So I've kind of select some relevant, very few, but relevant papers on this topic, because I think it's extremely important that we take um, into account these results. Um, this is one of the first, the very first uh, papers that came out in 2011, which is not long ago um, in reality, but in, in technology terms, it's a uh, sort of the past era, basically. And this is a paper from Sparrow and colleagues um, who invented this name, this uh, Google effect, uh, which has really not much to do with Google itself. It's just a name that they gave to the possibility of having uh, information at our fingertips, of having information easily accessible on our phone or on our computers at any time. What are the cognitive, the potential cognitive consequences? consequences of this. Um, I, I can anticipate my conclusion and my, the conclusion is that we don't have uh, definite data yet. It's just a, an area of investigation that is too young to have uh, conclusive responses, conclusive answers at the moment and is uh, especially considering that it's a uh, it's, um, phenomenon, the, the growth and development of educational technology is a phenomenon that is growing so much that it's, it's a kind of different, uh, difficult area to, to do research on. But let's see what we have so far. So this is, as I was saying, one of the first papers. And what Sparrow and colleagues found was that uh, the result of our four studies suggest that when faced with difficult questions, people are primed to think about computers and that when people expect to have future access to information, they have lower rates of recall of the information itself and enhanced recall instead of where to access it. The internet has become a primary form of external or transactive memory where information is stored collectively outside ourselves. So this is a first preliminary result. These are first preliminary results that have then um, conf been confirmed in, in following studies. Um, in this, where we we um, we find that find out that uh, if we we know that we have access to information, that the information is there stored somewhere, and that it can have ease. Is um, easy access to it, then I don't bother learning it. Okay, we are all more or less aware of this, but um, in this first paper has been um, proved. Uh, here, the experiment basically was with two group of participants. One group was. Uh, um, well, both groups had to read sentences, if I remember well, 
but uh, to one group they said um, this information would be deleted uh, after you read it, after you have read it, and to the other group they said uh, you'll have this information, these sentences stored in the computer for later um, purposes. Okay, so one group believed that the information would disappear, the other group believed that they would be able to find, again, the information stored in the computer. The result of the experiment was that the first group remember better the information than the second group. And this happened also when both groups were explicitly told, remember this information, remember these sentences for future for a future test or whatever the, 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 the instruction were. So even, even the, the group that was explicitly told to remember the information, if they knew that information would be stored somewhere, they would remember less than the other group. So that means that uh, there's a sort of uh, implicit um, message that we give ourselves, we give to our brain, maybe knowing that the information is never really completely deleted and that there is always a possibility to, to recover it from our computer, that if it's there somewhere, then I don't really need to put too much effort to learn it. Okay. And as I said, this is one of the first papers, but then we had quite a few afterwards that uh, um found uh, the same the same results the same finding so this is the question the first question i want to ask you in, in this talk i i give you and i'll um pass to you more questions than answers but uh, this this is precisely my purpose is this my knowledge or is uh, internet knowledge this knowledge that you know I can read, I can get access to so easily and so quickly. Is it my knowledge or is the internet knowledge? And do I see the difference between the two uh, conditions, the two um, scenarios, let's say? Because the point is, as we'll see later, that it seems to be uh, that the, the, the boundary between what is my knowledge into my head and external knowledge in this sort of buffer memory that I've got in my pocket is kind of disappearing more and more um, with time. But we'll get back to that later. This is another effect, very interesting one. Uh, it's called, or they, they call it, photo-taking impairment effect. That was a definition by Anker in 2014. And according to this effect, we have that if we take pictures of things, say we go on holiday and we take pictures of whatever we see or whatever strikes our attention, we are more likely to forget details about those objects that we took the picture of than if we just pay attention to those objects or to those subjects without taking the picture. Why? And again, this has been first found out, let's say, in 2014, but then we have even a very recent paper um, that uh, consolidated those results. So why is it? Why is it that if we, we take picture to remember, right? So why is it that taking a picture means that then we are less likely to remember if, if um, I don't know, a week later or two weeks later, someone asks us about that particular subject or that particular object or that particular monument, that we took the picture of, why we are less likely to remember details than the person next to us who's just looked and paid attention to the very same object. It, does, it, it makes perfect sense from a cognitive point of view because 
we have to ask ourselves, where is our focus when we take the picture? We know where the focus of the camera is, and we know all the effort we make to, you know, to adjust the focus or with all the options that we now have to take pictures. We make sure that the light is good. We make sure that this other details is correct. We make sure that the position is fine. So where is our focus? Our focus is on the picture taking. It's not on the object. The focus of the camera is on the object, but our focus is on the act of taking the picture. So it makes, whereas the, the focus of the person next to us that is just looking and thinking and paying attention to the object of interest is on the object of interest. That's why the other person will remember it better. Of course, we, we then have a picture, we then have a database of pictures and we have data that we can access even in, in 10, 20, 50 years time and then we'll remember that we won't actually remember, we just see a picture that takes back takes us back there. But uh, those results are, are perfect, make, make perfect sense for a cognitive psychologist. Because then this is another important question, pictures aside, as teachers and as students, we always have to ask ourselves this question, where is our focus? Talking about attention, okay? As we were talking about memory earlier on, uh, asking ourselves whether the knowledge is ours or whether the knowledge is of an external entity compared to us. Now it makes perfect sense um, from an attentional point of view, asking ourselves where is our focus? Okay, here we have more data. These are data from an experiment published in 2021 where the author compare people that could uh, access information on the internet and people that couldn't, that just try to reason and remember um, using the, only their brain, okay? What did they found? They found that uh, people that had access to, to the internet to find information, they ended up with a higher perceived ability to access external information. They ended up with a higher perceived ability to think and remember because of the simple um, fact that they had access to the internet, right? And they labeled this uh, cognitive self-esteem. You can see here on the left, uh, cognitive self-esteem external, ability to access information, and cognitive self-esteem internal, ability to think and remember, okay? Having access to the internet inflated these two measures and also inflated the estimate of predicted knowledge even with no access to the internet. And this is predicted knowledge, internal attribution of how much I know and how much I will know even when I have no access to the web. For example, in an exam, for example, in a test that I have to undertake tomorrow or next week. Okay, what we are saying here is that the simple access, access um, to the web, it, it, uh, please, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't need, we don't have to uh, use the web to access information and study at all. What I'm saying here is that we have to be aware of this and make sure that when we learn, when we read, when we study, when we access information on the web, on books, wherever, we have to be uh, conscious and we have to pay attention and ask ourselves, did I learn or did I just read information? And as teachers, I think it's extremely important that you point out this to your students. Because if do, just doing and studying easily, quickly, having a quick access to every possible information 
inflates our sense of uh, uh, predicted knowledge and predicted performance, then we have the typical case of the student that comes to us and say, how, how, how is it possible that I got such a low mark in my exam? I've studied so much. I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. I've heard a lot of comments like that. So please, let's be aware of this and let's make sure. Or um, it is also uh, perfectly fine in general, I'm talking in general here, to decide that we don't want to bother learning so and so because this is not too relevant. This is something that I might need in, in 10 years' time. I, I, so I don't, but it's important to know that it's there and that I can have access to that information if I need it. Fantastic. But it's us that have to discriminate and decide what I want to learn and make sure that I learn it and what I don't want to uh, spend uh, um, cognitive effort to learn. I just want to have it there if I need it in the future. But I need to make a conscious decision. Okay? That's what I want to, to say. Because we end up in a sort of cognitive paradox here because if searching the internet inflates people's confidence in their knowledge and at the same time increases people's propensity to rely on the internet to find information, that doesn't make a lot of sense because if I have an inflated confidence in my knowledge, why do I have to end up relying on the internet more and more to find information? Don't you... You see the sort of clash in this? If I'm confident in my knowledge, I, I shouldn't need, you know, to uh, search on the web all the time, even for stupid or very simple information. But that's what we are all doing more and more, uh, not being aware of these sort of dynamics. Because this is what is happening. This easy and smooth process um that by which we can get information from that very light and easy uh, easy to access thing that we ha all have in our pockets is creating this sort of osmosis between our brain and our external buffer memory that they are getting closer and closer almost uh, um, uh, and they are almost uh, impossible to discriminate from one another, okay? What is the, the point here? The point here that the point is that we might get into um, so-called fluency bias. We might be the victims of this bias and that we is very common at cognitive level, is extremely frequent especially among students. And this bias, um, it's, a, it's a sort of mistake that we make when judging our learning. For example, you can have a fluency bias at encoding when we encode, when we register information, when we learn information, when we read maybe a text or a chapter in a book or something on the web, okay? And the bias goes like that. Oh, that was easy to understand. Therefore, I remember it surely for the test next week. That therefore is the bias. Because the fact that something is easy, easy to read, easy to understand, easy to study now, doesn't mean that then I'll remember the information in the future. Okay? Same thing might happen at retrieval. For example, at retrieval, and there's a reason why it's between brackets. Because more often than not, retrieval is not real retrieval. So, and that happen, happens with, with books and with mm, computers. 
uh, when as students we need to revise material for an exam, for a test, what do we do too often? We revise re-reading stuff. We revise re-reading or researching stuff on the internet and, and we just quickly revise again re-reading information. But that's not uh, efficient revision. Effic efficient revision would be real retrieval from our brain without external aids of information. That would be real retrieval, real consolidation of content. And in that case, we could actually say, oh yes, I retrieved that in my memory easily with no external aids. Therefore, my guess is that I'll be able to retrieve information next week during the exam or during the test. But that is real retrieval. What we often have is that the retrieval is not from our memory, but it is from an external source. Therefore, the bias. Okay. We have just read or reread something and we say, oh, yes, is this and this and this. I remember. No, you are not remembering. You have just reread it. So if you make prediction, now, after you reread information about what you will be able to do in a week time, that prediction will be probably inflated. And that's demonstrated in the literature mm, with abundance of details. Okay, So uh, easy access to the information, it's very likely to produce a fluency bias because it's so easy to get information that we forget, we don't notice that the information we 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 found it on our on the phone, not in our brain. So we very easily um, can make performance prediction wrong performance predictions, but we'll get back there uh, later on. So fluency based judgments are generally considered to be the primary source of inaccuracy of metacognitive judgments, as well as the primary reason why metacognitive control goes astray in self-regulated learning. That's exactly what I was saying before. Okay, And that's the reason why so many students complain about low marks for something that they studied and they prepare and then they revised so many hours and so many afternoons for. Right? And uh, by the way, me, uh, metacognitive abilities, metacognition is the best predict or one of the best predictors for educational performance, for, for learning performance. If I'm good with my metacognitive abilities in, uh, for example, judgment of learning or metacognitive abilities in, in my reasoning, in my studying, in my problem solving, then it's very likely that I will also have good results at school and or at the university. And that is as well from, from is a very consolidated piece of data from, from the literature. Okay, source memory is another aspect that might be affected by our continuous reliance from uh, the an external source of information. What do we mean with source memory? We mean remembering where we got the information from, okay? Failure in source memory gives, um, my my lead us, let's say, without our awareness, um, into the phenomenon of uh, crypto, cryptomnesia, which is, forgetting where we stole the information. It's a typical situation where, for example, we have a brilliant idea, we have a brilliant thought, and we think that is our thought. And, but we have actually forgotten that that very same idea, that very same thought came from something we heard or we read two weeks earlier or a month earlier somewhere. Okay, That's cryptomnesia, and that's unconscious. Another thing is plagiarism, and that's very conscious, but that's another story. It has nothing to do with source memory failure. 
Okay, so going back to source memory, these are data that I won't look with, into details because this is not the purpose of, of the talk. But the, um, this is a paper published in 2022. And what the author found out, they were comparing source memory ability uh, between people who got the information on the phone and people who got the information in their brain, basically. Okay. They also control for uh, using their own phone or using the experimenter or the lab provided phone, but these are details. Results are that people were more likely to take credit for retrieving information from memory have after having truly access that information on a phone than vice versa, okay? So people who got the information from the phone, they were more likely to mistake that information from, for their own knowledge than people who got the information mm, in their brain, thinking about it, and uh, mistakenly taking it for information that they got on the phone. So source memory might also be affected in this sense and what the one of the comments that i would print and put in every single classroom in every single school or university is the following technology users can only take full advantage of digitally enabled strategies and techniques to the extent that they accurately monitor the state of information available in their head and information in their digital portfolio in the pursuit of their values goal. That's exactly my point and is exactly what I was saying before, so I won't go, I won't repeat it. This is another very relevant, a very important uh, paper that came out in uh, 2019. Uh, the authors are Elizabeth Marsh and Suparna Rajaram. Suparna Rajaram is um, a very big name in my field is an extremely um, important uh, researcher in, in the field of learning and memory. And she published this paper um, in 2019. And in the very same issue of Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition, you have replies and comments uh, to this paper from other authors and a final uh, comment, a final reply from Marsha Rajaram at the end and is extremely interested. If you are interested in this topic, I definitely suggest to have a look at it because you have um, a very good uh, source of information for this kind of uh, topics. Uh, in this paper, the authors talk about the, the internet and characteristics of the internet, quite technical. I won't go into that because it's Mm, information that we more or less all know and understand by now. But they also uh, ask questions, very relevant questions about the consequences for cognition, consequences of using the internet. And I picked some of them to, to share with you here. Are there costs of, to offloading memories to the internet? Well, we, we just saw that, yes, there are costs. There might be costs of offloading um, memories to the internet. One effect is the so-called Google effect, so the tendency to forget or not even um, bothering to learn things that we know that are there somewhere and I can easily access whenever I want. Another effect is the cognitive, but this is a positive effect, a cognitive unload for a deeper processing of information. What do we mean with that? I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that uh, technology is extremely useful, extremely important for, for example, people, people with learning difficulties. Okay, so and this is uh, why it's it's important and it's uh, useful because through let's say technology because of course the tools may vary according to the difficulties at all according to the problem according to the solution they offer but what they basically do is that that they unload cognitive load that otherwise would bear on the 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 brain of the person, of the students, 
so it, it frees um, space, cognitive space, cognitive resources, cognitive potential that might be uh, focused on, uh, for example, deeper processing, for example, on uh, better attention, and so on. So offloading um, cognitive load onto a technological tool, could be my computer, could be the internet, could be um, whatever app or platform that I'm provided with, can be extremely useful to make my life easier and free space, free resources, especially if I'm a young learner that is still uh, learning and still uh, consolidated um, abilities and knowledge in whatever field, so that I, I can free resources to dedicate to a better comprehension, to better attention, to better focus, to better working memory, to better reasoning, etc., etc. Okay, so there are costs and there are benefits uh, to offloading memories to the internet or to offloading information, let's say, to the internet. Okay, does using the internet become habitual? The quick and easy answer is yes, it is. And uh, um, if I can find it on the internet, I will make the effort to think about it, even in the case of easy questions. Unfortunately, this is the tendency that not only in this paper, but in, in other and uh, subsequent papers they found that uh, searching information, searching answers in, to the internet has become so habitual that we do it even to ask, uh, mm, I'm not saying our name, but very, very, very easy questions. It, um, yeah, and that's a bit of uh, a risk because um, one thing is to search for information that is difficult to find, very difficult to find. Another thing is to ask information that we actually know. We just, we are just too lazy to make the effort to think about it. Okay. Does the internet encourage superficial processing? And if so, when? Okay, that is a kind of mixed um, uh, field because, of course, we also have all the, the field of the social uh, networks uh, and, uh, of course, using social network and becoming the social network um, more and more prominent in our lives. Uh, it seems that, but I'm, I'm not going into that in this in this talk, that, uh, you know, we, we are becoming um, uh, kind of shallow, shallow learners because we are so uh, used by now to switch continuously for, from one information to another, one comment to another, one page to another, that... Uh, mm, there might be the possibility that we this is becoming very, very natural for us. But this is not what I want to talk about here. I wanted to just point out this experiment where they had people, in this experiment they had a group of people. This is an experiment mentioned in the paper from uh, Raja. The group of people uh, to both the groups um, were given the same information i can't remember whether they were headlines or just information in general i don't know but it doesn't matter the 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 difference between the two groups was the fact that one group just had to read the information and pay attention to it the other group had to decide whether they wanted to share that every every headline say every piece of information um, into the social networks. And what they found is that the second group who had to make this decision on whether to share it or not, they have lower rates of recall. Why? It's similar to the picture effect. Because they, they had to invest resources into this decision-making, into deciding whether they wanted to share the information or not. And that, that simple task um, absorbed energy 
energy that was not devoted to attention, to memory, to thinking, to the deep processing, etc. So no surprise at all that this second group had lower rates of the call, but that's quite significant from the point of view that we are taking in this in this webinar. Because what it might be happening is just this the speed accuracy trade-off that it might be it might be taking place. Okay. We we mm, we give priority to speed, to easy access, to frequent changing of uh, focus of attention uh, compared to uh, instead of um, to the accuracy and uh, a deeper learning of the information. Does using the internet require a different kind of metacognitive awareness? Remember, we, we were talking about metacognition a few minutes ago. We were talking earlier on about uh, predicted performance, right? So about the rate, uh, about the estimate of uh, predicted performance on the basis of what I've just got access to with this uh, fluency bias that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Other these are other type of judgments that we, uh, at a metacognitive level, we, we give when we study, for example, judgments of learning. Do I know this? I'm, am I prepared for this? Do I know this topic? Do Am I prepared for this uh, on this chapter? Do I know enough? Am I prepared enough or not? Do I need to revise or not? Etc. Judgments of learning. Feeling of knowing. Again, someone suggests a topic or asks us something and we say, yes, I, I know that. Or yes, I know that person. Um, and we give these sort of judgments. The, the extreme in this kind of phenomenon is the um, typical tip of, tip of the tongue information. You know, I, I know, I know, but I just can't remember right now the difference between availability and accessibility of the information. I've personally done a, a, my, my doctorate thesis on this topic, so it's a, it's a very interesting um, field to investigate. But we now um, are in the position of comparing this sort of metacognitive judgments, judgments of learning, feeling of knowing, with a new cognitive and metacognitive judgment, which is the feeling of findability. Um, so we, we are switching from feeling of knowing, do I know or not, of do I know where to find it or not? And that, of course, might well be a consequence. I'm not saying that this kind of judgment wasn't uh, you know, people would make it before the, the internet. Of course, we had it as well, but probably was not so uh, important and so significant as it is now for everything we said earlier on. Feeling of knowing and feeling of findability are uncorrelated with each other. Again, has been found in the literature. And but they they are both good at predicting the time it will take to the person to find the information, but they do not correlate with each other. So um, I might say I might think that yes, I know where to find it, but I have no idea where what we are talking about. Okay, I have no idea about this information, but yes, I'm very positive I know where to find it. Okay, so no surprise that the two, um, the two judgments are uncorrelated with each other. This is the final reply in, in this very same issue that I mentioned before of the same authors, uh, Supana Rajaram and Elizabeth Marsh, cognition in the internet age. What are the important questions? This title is, has been inspired by a very old paper that came out many years ago about memory and that that title was memory what are the important questions 
And now it makes perfect sense to ask ourselves, cognition in the internet age, what are the important questions? I gave you uh, a few important questions from my point of view, but I can guarantee you that it's not only my point of view. And I definitely uh, suggest you to go and read these papers if you are interested in this topic. So um, coming to a conclusion, and I assure you that I presented very, very, very little uh, quick information about this topic, but I just wanted to share with you this uh, knowledge, this awareness, because as I've already anticipated earlier on, um, this is not to say that technology is bad for us at all. Technology is extremely useful, is extremely useful to share information, education, to get access to education from everywhere. It's extremely useful in a way, paradoxically, to overcome the possible, let's call it, side effect of an easy access to the internet. Why is that? Because um, you had in, uh, in the presentations provided by the Bridges project, um, you have a few presentations of some, some uh, ed tech, some educational tool, and some of them are actually quite good at helping us, um, for example, uh, to, to learn at a deeper level. An example is easier than an explanation. For example, um, Edpuzzle, the, this educational tool that we can use to uh, prompt questions to our students. That's definitely good, definitely good to help um, our students to think deeper to the topic we are presenting right or tools that will be then illustrated by my colleagues that provide with metacognitive questions did i understand am i understanding what i'm reading did i understand this topic or do i need to go back and understand better this uh, this topic this uh, uh, chapter that i'm reading for example um, we have tools that, as I said, they help us if we have specific deficit in, uh, for learning. And uh, most of all, what my message, as I said, um, is that we have to share this with our students. We have to share this, um, this information that I share with you today. Because if we are aware of what we are doing when we study, if we are aware of the tools that we are using to study and what might happen if we don't use these tool well with, with real consciousness of what we are doing, if you are not aware of the fact that simply asking something, Google something, ask for something and read the answer, read the, the results, that doesn't mean learning in general, okay? We cannot assume that just Googling something, asking for a, uh, um, a response on some topic and reading it, that is not learning. It is learning if we think about it, if we are focusing our attention of the answer, if we make probably or possibly deeper and more profound research, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's why I wanted to um, end this uh, brief intervention with this sort of call to action. Know your brain to choose your text because texts are useful. Educational technology is useful, but it has to be uh, well managed and the teachers are um, the best uh, um, that the, the best help um, can come from, from teachers, from people that share this knowledge with students and that they teach how to learn and not only content, let's say. I'll pass it on to my colleague Alessandro. I'll yes, please. It. Thank you very much, Angela. My... Before moving uh, to Eleonora, actually we have here Professor Eratze. Well, 
would like to jump in to introduce better the whole um, Bridges project. So please. Hello, um, I represent the University of Foggia. I'm an assistant professor and the coordinator of the project Bridges. Uh, we planned it this way, so you could get interested in our project using Angela as a, uh, the best promotion <laughs> uh, material for it. So you now know that it is also about neurosciences, may, using neuroscientific knowledge in how to connect pedagogies and technologies. However, I'd like to also pre present our project. This project uh, has uh, several participants. It's a European project. So it is this uh, sort of a web webinar and the opportunities provided by the European Commission through the project Bridges that was actually funded under the specific special call for digital education uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And its name is uh, bridging educational emergency to digital pedagogies. And we saw that during the pandemic, we had a big problem of understanding how the brain works, how cognitive sciences and neurosciences can help us in this. And I think that is a fascinating how we can actually uh, actually discovering how much we don't know about the functioning of brain and how it connects to learning. And uh, I have good news for you. You don't have only this opportunity, but also this project is actually uh, uh, for the higher education uh, lectures where we are mostly researchers, but we have never been trained. I mean, unless those who work in ped pedagogy for being teachers. And this is why we created, based on research, some tools and uh, training material, which is um, our project. Now we'll, I'll paste the link here. This is our project website where you can find different parts you can explore. We have a MOOC where Angela and um, also Alessandro teach how this material is even more deeper and it's represented in several ways and you have a lot of opportunities to learn more uh, and also um, before moving to another uh, our um, uh, participant that is presenting uh, Dr. Alessandro Zocchi and Eleonora Vagnoni, I would like to let you know that there is another upcoming webinar and we also had a previous webinar that you can explore in our hub a digital hub that is created in the framework of this project. Now, I give the floor to Dr. Zocchi. Is this uh, Alessandro talking now or uh, Dr. Uh, no, no, actually, I Eleonora is coming. Yes. Hello, Eleonora. So I'll okay. just stop talking and give the floor to the experts of the subject. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Okay, Please, thanks. Eleonora, go ahead. I'm sharing my screen. Oops. Okay, so uh, today I would like to bring my experience with educational technologies and how I try to prompt the use of higher cognitive abilities, both in class, but also to address um, exam questions. So today I would like to cover these topics, specifically this topic, so how to use um, educational technologies and specific educational technologies, um, the ones that have used to create quizzes to um, design interactive lectures. Linked to this topic, it is the second one. So how to use quizzes to um, design formative feedback. And then I will move on the importance of um, prompting the students to use higher cognitive abilities, both in class, but also to um, address um, um, exam questions. So the first uh, topic, um, I have used um, 
quizzes for several reasons, so to reach several goals. At the beginning of my unit, I usually use quizzes to test a student's uh, prior knowledge. So this means that I want to check, for example, what they remember from the previous years. I want to uh, check uh, their knowledge and if they are able to remember um, some topics. Uh, then I use the quizzes as a form of formative self-assessment. So um, regarding uh, this aspect, I would like to bring my experience with uh, Panopto during the um, lockdown and during online teaching. So to create a more interactive lecture when I was just providing the students with a recording, I have structured my recording so that um, during it, the, part the students to go ahead uh, with the recording, they had to complete um, some quizzes. And the quizzes uh, were regarding and they were focused on the topics presented so that to proceed and um, with the next uh, chapter, they had to complete and uh, respond to a few questions. Um, I want to stress that this was a form of formative self-assessment, so they didn't receive any kind of mark I was not checking how many attempts uh, they used to get the uh, correct answer, but it is just a way um, for uh, the students to check their understanding. Then I will show also some examples of how uh, to use quizzes um, for peers' assessments and then to create... Uh, Eleonora, I'm sorry yeah? to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I, I think we are seeing only the first slide. In some way, the presentation didn't start, or it's not okay. moving. Maybe because I put a uh, full screen. Full screen uh, needs, to be, needs to be up, yes. OK. Um, OK. So can you see now the slides, or just one, the first one? Uh, it's the outline and not the actual presentation. So we see the, the slide, the number four. Okay. It's like the, um, the slide show didn't start. But you can go on this way if you, it, it's okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure how to, because it, it was working earlier. Um... Uh, you you, you um... might, um, Exactly. Get out of the of sharing the screen. Start the presentation first, and then okay. share the the presentation. Let's see if it works that way. Okay, just a second that it is uploading. No problem. Speaking of the usefulness of technology. <laughs> Is it better now? Okay, it's the same as before. Okay. But that's okay. Continue that way. We, we can see the slides, of course. Okay, okay. Uh, is, it, is it just the... Okay. 
Okay, si desprinde, però, whole sì, screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so the educational technologies that I have used to create interactive lectures, I've made here a list. Um, these are software um, very similar to each other. So I've used Mentimeter and I will uh, show you an example of one of my lectures. Uh, Panopto, as I've said earlier, um, I was creating recording with um, quizzes. Uh, that allowed me to check and actually allowed the students to check and self-assess their uh, learning and understanding. Um, another tool is Quizlet and then Poll Everywhere. Okay, so with Mentimeter, I create um, these quizzes and scenarios. So, for example, um, this is... Um, parts of a lecture where instead of um, describing what is representative bias, um, I actually ask the students to participate in a mini experiment. Um, so this scenario is taken from a paper. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with uh, the work of Daniel Kahneman. Um, so in their paper, uh, the participants were um, had to read uh, these scenarios and respond to some questions. So instead of uh, first uh, describing um, what is this bias and um, what the participants had to do in this experiment, what I have done during this lecture it is to actually um, give uh, the students this scenario, to read it together in class, and then to uh, respond to the question. So, This is nice because we see in real life, in, uh, online and live, um, the responses that we usually get uh, from a sample of participants. So please ignore the numbers. This was the second run of the same lecture. So this is why the numbers of, are so low. But what we see in this scenario is that um, usually participants when I presented with the description of this person, Rudy, um, they think that the most likely um, the job of this person is uh, the artist, uh, even if uh, this kind of job is the less um, likely. Um, this experiment was run in the US, so there are far more farmers than trapeze artists. So um, taking into account probability, the participants should respond with the first answer, so farmer. Instead, they um, compare how well, how representative is this person, so Rudy, and how well uh, the description of Rudy matches the uh, representation that they have of an artist. Um, as I've said, another software that I have used is Panopto again, uh, to uh, create a recording with um, questions. Um, so the students need to respond to the question to go ahead and watch the rest of the recording. And then again, a poll everywhere. So I've used the same uh, software and uh, educational technologies also to create, to design formative feedback. So formative feedback, we know that uh, it is the part of the learning uh, experience for the students. So uh, there are several forms of formative feedback. Um, the students can assess their own work. They can assess the work of another person, so peer assessment. And they can actually give formative feedback to the teachers. Um, so I have designed a tool um, that is composed of three parts. So one part it's, is focused on self-assessment. So the students, um, and this tool works best during practical sessions. So in the example that I will show in a second, uh, students um, already participated in a lecture where I gave them the basic knowledge of a software and uh, some statistical analysis. 
Then during the practical session, they had the possibility to self-assess their performance. So to reflect and critically assess their own learning, a crucial aspect um, of this tool is that we do not ask for the flaws in their performance, but we ask the strength in their performance. So this is crucial, especially when the students are assessing the peers' performance. Because um, usually for students, uh, the feedback uh, is, can be a frustrating experience, can be also embarrassing if we are highlighting the flaws in a performance. Instead, in this way, especially when we uh, need to give a uh, feedback to someone else, it is important to uh, focus on the uh, strength of their work. Um, having a tool uh, for self-assessment, uh, for peer assessment, and to give feedback also to teachers, um, highlight the importance of the voice of the students. Indeed, um, so the last part of uh, the tool um, is um, an opportunity for uh, collaborative learning. So usually what I do, I divide the class in pairs so that uh, students work uh, with a peer. And um, so in the first part, as students reflect on their work, and uh, then they reflect on the peers' work. And then there is this part where they share what they have done correctly, so the strength of um, uh, their performance, uh, and they work together. Then the last part, of course, uh, involves the feedback to the teacher. And uh, this is the part where we show uh, the importance of, of their feedback. So usually I involve how I include and I take into account their feedback, for example, from previous years, the feedback um, uh, of students from uh, previous years, and then I change my units according to their feedback. So it is crucial that the, their voice is heard. Um, as I will say several times during this presentation, it is important to uh, enhance and increase uh, students' literacy regarding um, the way in which we assess them, uh, the way in which uh, we uh, teach, for example. And um, so students might not be familiar with self and peer assessment. So what I usually do, I um, dedicate um, the first lecture um, to uh, show the way in which I uh, want to structure my lectures, the way in which I teach, and the way in which they will be assessed. Um, yes, this is a way also to increase uh, student confidence and uh, to increase, as, as I've said, the uh, assessment literacy. It is also a nice way to design well um, session so that there is flow between the teacher and the student. So we create a space where my voice as well as the student's voice is heard. So this is the example, there is the first part. Um, first of all, I start uh, checking um, how difficult was the task for the students uh, to then calibrate it uh, for the uh, following years. Then there is a part on um, self-assessment where I ask them the strength of their work. And I usually include an example um, because the students might they're sometimes confused, they don't know, and they tend to focus on what they were not able to do on uh, the errors. So I give them some examples. Um, then the part on uh, peers assessment, um, then the uh, part on collaboration. This is also a part where students can get stuck. So um, in this um, form of uh, formative assessment, the role of the teacher it is to guide and to lead the session. So we need to check um, if, for example, if the, both students have done the same steps correctly, 
they are not sure what to share because they have done uh, both of them have done the same a part of the uh, task correctly so in this case um the um, uh, teacher has to step in and to work uh, with them and then at the end as i've said there is a part on the assessment of my own teaching okay so now um, I would like to share a um, form of a teaching that I have used uh, to prompt uh, the use of higher cognitive functions um, in class. Uh, so this is the uh, flipped classrooms. So what are the flipped class classrooms? Are the classrooms where the order of the lecture is inverted. So in this case, um, the students come prepared to the lecture. This means that they have to engage with self-study before coming to the lecture. So why do I use flipped classrooms? Because um, we see that um, this kind of uh, teaching um, increase uh, student engagement. Um, Students in uh, during flipped classrooms are active learners. So um, there have been already an episodes on uh, bridges regarding the difference between um, frontal lecture, where the lecturer is presenting the material, uh, to a passive audience. Um, so this is not an optimal way uh, of learning. Uh, we should aim to have um, active learners in our class. Um, and this is a way uh, to, to do that. Um, um, depending on the way in which we design the session, then we can have also collaborative learning. So once the uh, students come prepared to the session, then they share the knowledge, they can share their doubts and their questions regarding the material. So in my experience, I usually um, use the uh, flipped classrooms in, to design the practical session for several reasons. Because um, in the lecture, as I've said, usually we present the material. Uh, the practical session um, needs to be practical. So um, during the self-study, uh, students have the opportunity to read, to memorize the material, and then they come to the class to engage in higher cognitive functions, so to discuss, to work in groups, and to critically evaluating. Um, so for example, I use mostly scientific papers. Um, this is because the scientific papers are found uh, difficult by the students, so they have uh, the possibility to read them, uh, to spend time uh, elaborating and processing the information. Then they have the opportunity to come to class and then discuss with the teachers and with peers. Um, yeah, as I've said, uh, I have already said this. So uh, structuring the um, uh, sessions in this way, we have a first part of uh, self-study at home. And then we have instead in class um, activities that prompt the students to use higher cognitive uh, levels of information processing. So in uh, flipped classrooms, our role um, as uh, lecturers are, is, of course, to lead the session and to engage the students in a discussion. It is also to, um, an opportunity to address their uh, questions. Um, during the uh, flipped classrooms, the students are active learners, so they are um, engaged in completing uh, completing uh, tasks um, something that i would like to mention is the fact that i used uh, flipped classrooms also because they are inclusive so they can meet the needs of uh, students for example requiring additional learning supports 
but they are also uh, useful and can help uh, also international students. So they have enough time at home so they can read the scientific paper at their own uh, pace and then they uh, can come to the class uh, to discuss it. Uh, one aspect that we need to consider when uh, we want to include uh, flipped classrooms in our uh, teaching is that um, a certain level of preparation is uh, needed and is required both from the lecturers and uh, from the students. So, of course, um, on our hand, we need to make sure that the material is um, uh, given and available to the students in advance, so not just the classic three days before uh, the session, but at least one week before the session. Um, and then, of course, uh, on the students' hands, uh, they need to uh, come to the session uh, prepared. So they have already have done uh, their reading. Of course, there are situations where um, I mean, there, there are uh, some not negative aspects, but aspects that we need to take into account when using flipped classrooms. So, for example, uh, students um, can come to the class uh, without being prepared. So, this is a problem mostly for the students who didn't prepare, because actually for the rest of the group is um, an opportunity to share their knowledge and actually to practice uh, and check their understanding. It is, in a way, um, uh, an opportunity for self-assessment. So you understand how well you have understood a topic in your, if you need to explain it to someone else. Um, another uh, challenge uh, that is present when we design flipped classroom is um, the fact that students might mm, some, sometimes uh, they think that um, they don't need to come to the session because they have already all the material, the topic was already covered in the lecture, so there is no need uh, to come to the practical session. So again, as I've said earlier, uh, in these cases, at the beginning of my unit, I always uh, dedicate a um, lecture and a session to explain why I use a specific form of assessment or a specific form of teaching so that I, I have time to highlight the benefits of this uh, form of uh, teaching and uh, learning. Okay, so this is related to what I have said now. So um, the aim is to use higher cognitive abilities, both in class and also uh, to address the exam question. So how to do that? We need to focus on the problem solving learning. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the um, problem solving learning. I will start saying that um, we uh, consider the higher brain functions, uh, functions like problem solving, reasoning, decision, decision making, and, um, and here I have put this image just to uh, say that, um, of course, when we engage in this kind of um, higher cognitive function, specific networks in our brain are activated. But we don't really need to go into details, but um, this is just to um, highlight the importance of a basic knowledge of neuroscience, in this case, um, the neural basis of uh, co higher cognitive function uh, can be um, uh, useful. So what is a problem? Uh, a problem exists when uh, someone uh, lacks the relevant, relevant knowledge to produce an immediate solution. Um, in the field of neuroscience, we categorize the uh, problem in uh, several ways. So there are well-defined problems, for example, the um, play of chess, where there is a set of rules, and if you follow the rules, you can get um, to the correct answer to the correct move. Then there are the, or at least to reach the correct answer, you need to follow the rules. 
There is also, as an example, the Tower of Hanoi, but this is um, neuropsychological tests. And um, so it is a very specific example. Um, then we have the ill-defined problems. So these are problems that are un underspecified. And this is actually uh, the most uh, common problems that we um, um, face um, in our everyday life. So unfortunately, when we face a problem, we do not have a set of rules. And if we follow the rules, we reach the correct answer. Then there are knowledge-rich problems. These are problems that we can uh, solve just um, having specific knowledge. Um, and the knowledge lean problem. So these are problems uh, that do not require specific knowledge. Um, all the information that we need uh, is included and contained in the initial problem statement. Um, this is... Um, um, so usually it is easier to do research in the um, uh, knowledge uh, lean problems uh, because of course um, um, it would be uh, more difficult to um, have uh, specific samples of uh, participants uh, to address the knowledge uh, rich problems. Okay, so um, to uh, create uh, problem learning, um, problem-based learning, um, so the problem-based uh, learning involves the critical thinking and analysis. Uh, students must understand the concepts um, because they need to, as I've said, have and engage in higher cognitive level of um, information processing. Um, it is also a self-directed uh, learning experience. And with the um, uh, problem solving based question, for example, we apply the material, for example, covered in a lecture, and we applied it to real world uh, situations and examples. Um, to address um, a problem-based question, students uh, need to research um, and uh, create the answer. So it is not enough to uh, remember the specific paragraph in a textbook. It doesn't work like that. It is not the old style question where we present the title of a paragraph and we expect the students to cover um, um, uh, what it is covered in a specific paragraph of a textbook. Here, uh, the uh, students are given with um, different kind of material, and um, they need to understand uh, the material to compare, for example, the different experiments, um, uh, the different uh, piece of information. They have to critically evaluate it and uh, present it to address uh, the problem-based question. For us as teachers, as lecturers, to create a problem-based question, we need to keep in mind some uh, aspects. So uh, first of all, the learning objectives. So what we want the students to learn uh, from, uh, these, um, uh, from our lecture, from our unit and then create real life problems. So for example, as I've said, I teach cognitive psychology. And um, when I create problem-based question for my units, I create this scenario. Uh, so for example, you are a researcher working in a lab. So it is nice that we link what they are learning uh, to their uh, future career. Um, so for some of them, there will be a time where they are a um, researcher and they need to solve a problem and they need the, uh, the knowledge that we have presented throughout uh, the unit uh, to solve the problem. Um, these are also some aspects that we need to consider. So the old style question where we focus 
on a specific topic of on a specific argument presented, for example, in a textbook, um, is easy uh, to mark in a way because we know what we expect from the students. We know the topics uh, that uh, should be covered in our response. Instead, with the um, problem-based uh, question, I mean, there are several ways in which the student can solve the problem, and we need to account for that. Um, so we need to account for that uh, both with our marketing team, but also with the students. So we need to make sure um, um, that we explain to the students how we are going to evaluate their performance. So, for example, that we um, give a lot of weight and importance to the reasoning, to the problem solving skills, to the critical, evalu critical evaluation of a topic and not just the mere list of um, um, topics that have been covered um, in a lecture. Not just the memory and the ability yeah, to, to, to list them all. Um, again, as I've said before, uh, when we use uh, different types of uh, teaching and assessment tools, uh, we need to um, increase the students' literacy uh, regarding them. Um, so to uh, devote uh, parts of the teaching on explaining how the problem-based question, for example, work. What I usually do, uh, it is to present um, basic, simple uh, problem-based questions at the end of my lectures. So um, I create a um, question that is kind of easy in the sense that covers just the topic uh, that I have covered during the lecture. So in this way, the students are uh, familiarized with this format. And in this case, they also have the opportunity um, to practice, to practice the problem-based question uh, then um, uh, for the uh, final exam, for example. So I think that that's all. So I wanted to share with you uh, the educational technologies that have been using, um, especially after and during the pandemic, and uh, some of the practices that I have included in my teaching that I have found uh, particularly useful uh, for online teaching, but uh, that actually I have applied also to in-person teaching, uh, because these were practices that I have seen uh, increase the uh, student uh, engagement. So I think... Thank you very much, Eleonora, if, if that is all. First of all, I remind you also, um, all the watchers, if they want to ask some questions, please write on the chat. So we'll try to answer as uh, better as we can. And so in this final part, uh, I would like to show you some uh, brief information regarding uh, uh, intelligence, actually, in direct uh, a connection to what both Angela and Eleonora just uh, talked about. Let me share my screen. Here we go. Let's see if it works. Can you see it? Is it working? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will talk about briefly uh, about intelligence, as I said, but also about the near and far transfer of knowledge and uh, also about metacognition, but actually I actually talked about it uh, uh, quite a lot. But and then I will uh, give you a couple of examples of the use we can uh, um, have uh, with some uh, specific uh, digital tools. So one for the metacognition and the other one will be about the famous artificial intelligence. And uh, I will try to involve both Eleonora and Angela to discuss a little bit about it with a specific example. Uh, but first, uh, let me uh, tell you that um, probably you know already, but if you don't know, uh, according to many um, investigators and scientists, basically 
uh, we um, have two kinds of intelligence. Uh, the first one is the so-called fluid intelligence. And as you can see in these um, four points, uh, there are the, uh, these are the characteristics of the fluid intelligence. It's the ability to handle new situations and uh, adapt to change. It's obviously fundamental to critical thinking and problem solving and indicates the ability in abstract and logical uh, thinking. Uh, the point here, uh, quite uh, interesting, is the, um, that it is believed to be minimally influenced by experiences. So this fluent intelligence uh, is what we can consider the basic uh, ability that our brain gives us to understand the world around us and to solve some problems in a logical way. So it's not very much connected to all the things that we can uh, learn uh, during our lives. Uh, scientists believe actually that we can uh, inve investigate more deeply uh, this kind of intelligence with different tests. Probably you know the, the famous uh, intelligence quotients tests. There are many types and each of them uh, will investigate more precisely some aspects of this um, type of intelligence. So there is a spatial ability, pure reasoning, the processing speed, of course, the verbal ability, and the working memory as well. Uh, what apparently all the, uh, the scholars agree is that all these factors all together will uh, combine together and, and they call, um, they don't talk about any more intelligence, but they prefer to talk about uh, the so-called G factor, where the G stands for uh, the general intelligence. And uh, it is composed by all these abilities, uh, five abilities um, um, described here. And what is interesting is that if someone is particularly good in one of them, I mean, for example, working memory, uh, there are strong uh, cor positive correlations with all the others. So, so apparently they are all connected all together. But the thing, uh, uh, the interesting thing is that apparently it is mostly uh, genetically uh, determined. So it's not uh, influenced by our experiences and what we can uh, learn. And uh, it's even not modifiable too much uh, along our lives. So if we are... Uh, very good in this kind of abilities, we will probably keep them uh, along our lives. Uh, according uh, to some studies, uh, uh, the, uh, the IQ uh, as measured with these tests are also uh, good predictors for a number of uh, uh, life uh, um, characteristics, so to speak, like the scholastic achievements, the professional success, but even um, not so known aspects of our lives like longevity, even, even health. Uh, so what they believe uh, is that actually who is particularly good with the, all these abilities, they can actually be quicker in understanding, uh, but also uh, very good learners. Mm, why, when we um, have to consider that learning something is actually when we not only learn conceptually, but we modify our behaviors in the appropriate way in order to exploit as much as possible the information, the information that we are uh, actually learning. However, as you might understand, we have also a different kind of intelligence, which is called uh, crystallized intelligence. And this is the, the one um, uh, which probably we more instinctively think about it because it's, it refers, as the first point says, to all the knowledges and all the experiences that we gain over time. It is influenced, therefore, by any kind of learning, formal and informal education, and, of course, environmental factors. Because depending on where we uh, were born and how we were raised, what kind of uh, experiences we have, and so on, we will have completely different uh, learning experiences. The, number, uh, the, no the point number three says that it is actually displayed through proficiency and long-term memory recalls. Obviously, these are all the things that we learn over time. 
It can be anything, anything that regards our culture, from the way we, uh, I don't know, we we greet uh, between each other uh, to how we think, uh, or how we apply the knowledge uh, we have experienced uh, or we have uh, um, learned in school or uh, at the university. And that in some way has passed and has been consolidated inside our long term memory. Uh, it is used, of course, uh, all this information to solve uh, pro everyday problems and also make decisions uh, to the best, as usually it is said, uh, of our knowledge, of course. But as you can see, this is a very uh, specific intelligence. Uh, it's called the crystallized because it, it's not because it's not um, modifiable, it's just because it is the result of uh, whatever we learn and obviously we can learn many different things and modify all our knowledges and experiences along our life. Now I just talked about uh, the long-term memory and uh, um, which I don't know if you know this that actually this um, specific uh, um, cognitive uh, ability of our brain is apparently not part of the fluid intelligence. In, inside the fluid intelligence, uh, apparently it's more important uh, the, um, uh, the short uh, term memory or the working memory actually, which is apparently very um, uh, determined by genetics. The long term memory is uh, activated whenever we pass information from the working memory. We uh, apply the right study strategies, the right approaches, the right uh, methodologies in order to uh, consolidate our information and uh, put it, so to speak, inside those brain areas uh, where it will be there for uh, a, longer, a longer time. Um, if you think about it, uh, um, all this information well consolidated will become over time uh, who we are, basically. It will become what uh, we think we can do with our knowledge, how we can control our environment, how we can solve the problems, uh, and so on. And it is uh, always modifiable because we can always learn new things. Um, within this um, scenario, we can also distinguish uh, what it is called the near and the far transfer of, uh, of knowledge. Whenever we learn something, whatever it is, we activate, as uh, Eleonora and Angela have explained earlier, uh, some parts of the brains uh, we, which, is, uh, which are extremely important for attention and for the beginning of learning and the elaboration of the data. Uh, when we do this, for example, uh, when we, uh, let's imagine a, a very simple um, example, let's say that we have to learn uh, the uh, famous uh, Pythagorean uh, theorem. So our teacher will tell us the rule and probably will uh, show us an example, very simple, with the triangle and we will apply the, uh, the theorem. Then we can exercise and practice and in order to start to elaborate the information and do some practice, maybe through a test that the teacher is uh, uh, going to give us. Obviously, at the beginning, the, uh, the test is very simple. Probably the triangle used will be very similar to the one used by the teacher, but maybe with different values. So we have what is called the near um, transfer of knowledge because uh, we have understood the process and the principle that we have to learn but we are not going to apply it to a very different situation to that one that was used by the teacher but what happens when we try to apply it in completely different scenarios for example uh, will it be easy for us to apply the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the height of a building, for example. Uh, well, maybe it's not easy. Maybe it's not uh, something that we come up immediately as a, as a solution, depending on the data that we have, on the information we can gather, and so on. But you can see that the further we go from the initial situation, uh, the further we have to apply the initial knowledge. And this is actually quite difficult for, uh, for our brain to apply because we are going to... Um, 
uh, let's say, try to solve uh, more and more difficult problems uh, which are not completely related to the beginning learning of ours. Uh, on the lower uh, row, we can see even, uh, very, even very complex uh, situations like uh, calculations of distances of a, of, um, of a flight of an airplane from ground, for example, that can be calculated with the Pythagorean theorem, even uh, calculating the distance of some stars with some kind of uh, trigonometric or initially Pythagorean theorem applications. But as you can see, we have a lot of uh, creativity to use uh, and uh, original uh, problem solving to apply the same process. And this is actually very difficult for, for our brain. But as Angela and Eleonora has already seen and said, um, we know now that the best practices for uh, an efficient and effective learning where we can actually stimulate uh, good consolidation, good learning, and uh, stimulation of problem sol solving and transfer of knowledge at any level, we have uh, the metacognitive, metacognitive skills as well as the testing and the spaced uh, repetition practice. Uh, these apparently are uh, the best practices that we can teach to our students and apply as uh, students uh, in order to um, to be sure that we are actually on the right uh, path. Regarding the metacognitive, uh, metacognitive questions, uh, these are extremely interesting. Angela already said that, that uh, this is one of the best predictors for a good uh, learning. And uh, um, quite often, uh, as simple as it may seem, actually people usually don't, are not used to uh, ask themselves metacognitive metacognitive questions uh, there are uh, as angela already said many cognitive biases influencing our reasonings and unfortunately uh, making us believe that we know <laughs> much more than expected but meca metacognitive questions are extremely important i can uh, give you an example here with a graph for example we we suggest sometimes to uh, to the teachers that we uh, we teach uh, to give some tests some problems and then ask the students before giving the right um, the right answers uh, what is the perception they have on uh, the uh, number of correct answers, uh, for example. And uh, you can see on the x-axis axis here, uh, there is the number of estimated correct answers that the students can uh, decide. And then we give the, uh, the right, uh, the correction of, of the test. And therefore there will be a match between the estimated correct answers and the real correct answers. So each student, for example, we can see, I hope you can see the, my pointer, the red one. For example, let's see this point here. Uh, this is the, the point of one student who estimated uh, five correct answers out of six. But in reality, he answered correctly only to two. So he overestimated his ability, his or her abilities. On the other side, we have a completely different situation. For example, this point here, this was a student that unfortunately estimated a very low number of correct answers, but indeed he or she uh, um, answered almost correctly to all of them. So he underestimated their abilities. As you can see along this red diagonal, actually, we have the people who have a very good metacognition because uh, whoever was here, uh, they had a perfect match between the estimated and the real corrected answers in a bad situation or in good situations. Because here, for example, the student realized that, that he didn't know uh, the, the correct answers, he didn't know the, the subject, and therefore he got a very low mark. But up here, for example, we have a student who believed to have answered to all correctly to all answers and to all questions, and actually he or she did so. So this is a simple, uh, instrument uh, which can actually be um, uh, built directly, for example, with an Excel file or with the Google uh, uh, Sheets uh, in combination also with uh, the Google Forms, uh, for example, it will make it automatically. It's very useful uh, to use in the class uh, and uh, or for us as students uh, in order to evaluate and start this process of uh, uh, 
um, uh, uh, developing the habit to ask ourselves how we are going before actually we have the proper feedback in order to foresee what we have to do for the best and for the worst. So if we are doing fine, we know that we are on the right path. But if we are not, we will have to change something. Another tool which is very interesting, uh, actually, is uh, and specifically regarding uh, metacognition again, is uh, this one here. This is an application which is called I Do Recall. It's a very interesting one which um, allows to um, manage the knowledge in general, but in particular to study uh, texts. Uh, in this application, uh, one can uh, upload a specific text, uh, a book or uh, an article, for example, and one can start actually to study the book or the article and highlight a specific uh, keywords or specific uh, um, uh, key sentences. When you do that, for example, uh, uh, here I have highlighted, as you can see, cognitive biases, for example. But you have uh, on the left side of this application a specific space where you can build the famous uh, flashcards. If you remember the flashcards of this technique, actually Leonora mentioned some applications like a Quizlet, if I don't remember well, um, bad, uh, where you can build this cards with one question on one side and the answer uh, on the other side and you can auto evaluate yourself in this way in order to test yourself and as we have said before testing is one of the best ways to to study actually so this application can starting from a text they can build over time uh, a number of uh, uh, flashcards uh, that one can review and test ourselves uh, even using a specific uh, uh, time sheet that will uh, suggest us uh, how many times we have to repeat uh, the um, the flashcards that we that are more difficult for us for us for example but not only uh, i was talking about uh, metacognition this application is quite interesting because uh, up here uh, maybe it's not uh, visible very much. That's why I put a circle here red. There is a little image of a brain. It's not very visible, but there is. It's an icon of a brain. And if you click on it, uh, a little window will uh, pop out and uh, uh, it will ask you if you want a metacognition hint. So if we click on that window, we will have actually a metacognitive question. So the, the application will give us some uh, uh, prompts in order to think about how we are doing in our uh, learning process. There are many questions that are all, be all very interesting, but if for some reason that one which is explained in uh, at first, we can actually um updated here clicking here and we will have more more questions so in this way this application is very useful because it's helping us actually to apply all the uh, concepts that, that we know that the education on neuroscience is suggesting us in order to improve our learning now uh regarding artificial intelligence as you know uh, it's been uh, developing very much in the last uh, months and people are questioning a lot about uh, its use or not, in, uh, especially in uh, education. Um, I would like, uh, I've taken an example uh, coming from actually an actual uh, um, teaching that we, Angela and I, have done uh, recently, but I would like to involve both Angela and uh, Eleonora in uh, in this uh, in this discussion, because uh, some teachers asked us uh, that uh, they had the difficulties in uh, um, coming up uh, with some focused questions that we suggest uh, in their lesson plans. The focused questions are uh, questions that might uh, stimulate the curiosity uh, to the students in order to introduce a new subject, a new concept that the teacher. Uh, should teach uh, in that uh, specific day. So sometimes uh, I suggest the teachers uh, to try an artificial intelligence uh, to, to give them uh, uh, a hint. For example, the famous uh, chat GPT. And I show them 
an example. Here we have uh, a question that I actually asked the artificial intelligence. And it says, please suggest a focused question for a Pythagorean theorem lesson plan that will intrigue the students. So it's a very specific uh, question. Reply, this is the reply of the artificial intelligence. And it says, imagine you are an archeologist discovering an ancient pyramid. And this is quite interesting because it's giving us uh, uh, um, an idea on how to build um, a question that might stimulate curiosity. And then it continues, the sides of the base may measure 50 meters each, but its height is still unknown. Using the Pythagorean theorem, what could be the approximate height of this pyramid? This is a very interesting uh, suggestion that uh, ChatGPT gave us. Eleonora, Angela, in your, in your opinion, how is this prompt uh, for a teacher? Is it uh, a good one or, or not? Is it very specific? It can be used right away. What do you think? I think it's good because um, it def I, I mean, I'm imagining this uh, prompt, this question in a classroom with students. So I think this prompt could be very good to stimulate discussion in the class. Okay. So is it possible? Is it not possible? Does it make sense? Why yes? Why not? Et cetera. So um, I, will, it, I will go for it. In your opinion, <laughs> uh, is it very well described, this question? Could it be used uh, right away? in order to calculate the height of the pyramid? No, it's not immediate, but as I said, I mean, as always, as we always say, it depends on what's your purpose, what's your focus. If you want okay. to simulate discussion, it's perfect. If you want a clear, plain, obvious, straightforward example, example of how to apply the Pythagorean theorem, not quite so. Okay, very good. Do you have any comment, yeah. Eleonora? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is a nice opportunity to prompt a discussion and so um, the focus, uh, the importance on the reasoning more than just applying uh, some kind of set of formula. So to under really understand the questions, to really break down the aspects. So do you have all the information to be able to um, address the question, but what actually is asking you? the question. So I think that uh, this could be a nice task to do uh, during the, for example, the practical le le uh, session to increase the student's literacy about uh, the how we can structure different types of uh, questions and problem-based questions. In this Very case. good. Very good. But look what a teacher actually commented after I showed them uh, such a prompt. The comment from the teacher was, the question sounds plausible, but it doesn't make sense. The two sides of the base and the height of the pyramid are not the three sides of a right triangle. And that is true, actually, if you think about it. But it is true that one can take the suggestive idea of the archaeologist dealing with the pyramid and modify the question to make it sensible, of course. But I mean, he, according to him or her, I don't remember, there is no, not enough data to actually apply the Pythagorean theorem on uh, directly from the, the, um, the question that ChatGPT gave us. And actually it's true. However, he concludes, I'm a little worried about the ease of obtaining an unlimited amount of questions, answers, or texts that seem well done, but can contain all kinds of flows. And this is actually, actually true. However, I have commented, counter commented in this way. In fact, all artificial intelligences always warn that they can make all kinds of mistakes. So this is very well specified every time. And the fact that they are called intelligences it does not mean that they are infallible, actually. They make mistakes and they actually tell us so. Perhaps we should bear in mind that human intelligence is far from infallible to remind us that artificial intelligence also makes mistakes. This is interesting because many people 
uh, spend a lot of time uh, challenging these artificial artificial intelligences, trying to find uh, problems with it, forgetting that because of our way our intelligence is built and the influence of cognitive biases, we are probably less intelligent than we normally think. In any case, I continue, as you rightly say, because I was replying to the teacher, the answers of the artificial intelligences can give us insights and ideas for our work. And indeed, I uh, continue saying that interesting, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, the question elaborated by ChatGPT asks us actually what could be the approximate height of the pyramid. He didn't ask us uh, what is the exact height of the pyramid. He was actually implying that it was impossible to calculate um, actually the uh, the height of the pyramid with the data he was giving us. But this is not probably completely wrong because it could be used as an exercise for discussion, as both of you have said, to make students think about whether or not a problem can be actually solved with the theorem that uh, it was taught on that day, for example. So it's a good way to uh, apply critical thinking to find what are the best uh, solutions, to see and check if we have all the data uh, all the information, all the necessary information in order to apply that specific uh, theorem, or maybe we can find a different uh, solution. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, it could be used as an exercise uh, to estimate, as actually the question is asking, the height of a real pyramid by imagining, for example, that the lateral edges uh, are equal to the sides of the base, and from there, we can calculate the height by applying the, the theorem twice from the, for the diagonal at the base and then using the triangle, actually, that in that way, it could be built. It's actually quite, uh, it's an original and creative way to solve this problem, uh, which is not immediately understandable. It cannot come up immediately, but I mean, it's, it's quite useful and it's not the usual repetition of the, uh, of the process of the concept uh, just on the near, as we said before, uh, application of the knowledge, but it's a good way to apply the uh, critical thinking. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, concluding, I mean, technology, as both of you have said, uh, can be useful, definitely, but we have to know how to use it and to know the concepts behind them and uh, uh, as teachers, uh, as uh, educators, uh, our professors, we have to remember that we have to use our own intelligence, first of all, uh, both the fluid and the crystallized in order to use better this, um, this information and this technology to improve uh, our teaching and our learning. Okay, I have finished. Actually, we are right on time, uh, miraculously. I don't know if there is uh, uh, any any question from someone. Uh, no, apparently not, really. not. Okay. But yes, I think your conclusion was the best conclusion, Alessandro. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> like no, it's important to to know to know our our um, brain, to know our how our brain works, and to know how text and artificial intelligence in this case was to to make the most out of technology this is the, exactly. this is the real point so thank you for your contribution thank you to eleonora as well Thanks. if we don't have questions i think we can leave it there and thank you to all the people that um, okay. follow Some, this someone is writing maybe he is they are just saying a goodbye, or maybe not. Let's see. <laughs> no, just uh, thanking us, all speakers out there. Okay, thank you very much, Beatrice. Thank you all. Okay, thank you all. I think we can leave it there. And uh, yeah. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you very much. Bye for bye. now. Bye-bye.